Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Peter Robinson and today I have Lecky who is going to talk to talk to us about Uniswap V4 um, incubation program and talk about um, what is the, the um, hooks in Uniswap V4 and what that's all about. So Lecky, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks Peter for the introduction. Yeah, hi everyone, my name is Lecky Lau. I uh, currently is doing the PhD in the uh, University of Technology Sydney in the second year, uh, researching in the blockchain MEV space, um, planning on the papers around the single chain MEV and the cross chain MEV. Um, yeah, this talk it was like I was doing the uh the Uniswap. They have uh, the first um hook incubation i was participating into their cohort one and then while peter was doing the uniswap talk and then i was doing the program and then i was saying that maybe i can do a little bit talk about it a bit after the program finished so here here i go yeah yeah, well, I, and thank you very much for um sharing your find, you know, your the findings of doing that incubation program. I think it's going to be great, and one day you're going to share the output of your PhD here too, um, because I'm sure that'll be exciting too. So, um, yeah, P please present your slides. Okay. Yeah, so this talk is about the Uniswap V4 and the whole incubation that I was participated. So please note the talk is not beginner friendly as this is defined by the uh, V4 whole incubation as some content uh, reference from there. There's also like they have cohort to open as well. Basically, you could anyone could apply for it, but the the selection criteria is um is not a, a beginner like they select expert um like so that because the content is quite uh verbose <clears throat> so my plan is to do the talk and then leave all the question at the end because like it people might have lots of questions but they yeah, don't worry about too much i will just talk like a little bit of the, yeah, the under, yeah, the roughly understanding is okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the program was um eight weeks program. And then every week is about 10 hours across uh, two days. And then at the end, there's a hooker form, um, like a demo day that you present your um, demo. So, so V4 is still um, haven't deployed yet as the code is still not code freeze. It introduced quite a few different functionality, like the most popular is the uh, the hooks to provide much flexible functionality. And the singleton contract for efficiency is also an innovative way that now is every, everything is out under one contract, um, which is also related to the flash accounting system that uh, it, it managed the balance by itself um, within the whole contract itself. And this become unlimited fee tiers that no longer a fixed tier that you could customize a dynamic fee or, or different fixed fee. And it also support um, native ETH rather than just um, web ETH. And it's more community driven as Like you can do lots of different things and uh, um and the, the hooker phone etc. 
So V4 mainly contain the V4 core and V4 periphery. V4 core contains the core libraries. It's still not code freeze. When I was doing the uh, incubation program, like the no ops was was even like not implemented. And then we were like talking about the no ops and we wanted, and then until like at the end, before the the hooker phone start, then they have the no ops uh, uh, shifted into the code base. And currently it's, yeah, it's, it's still, I can see they still are uh, developing, committing codes. And to talk with the, communicate with the V4 core, you need to use the V4 uh, periphery, which contain lots of examples um, to, to, to uh, basically how you can use, use it with for different examples like dynamic fees, uh, twerk swap and et cetera. So flash accounting, you can see in the V3, when you're doing, this is called like a single or multi hop swap, you're jumping through different contracts, which contain the pools and different pool tokens. Now with V4, everything's under one single contract, which contains like, can be like lots of like, maybe dozens of different uh, tokens. And at the end, you, you just calculate about the Delta which will remove the, as you can see, remove all the extra costs on like jumping through the different uh, contracts. They also introduce a ERC6909 claim tokens. Basically it's a, it's a token for when you don't want your, receive your tokens now like it can it can save the it's also around like saving gas costs for example some of the erc20 token has lots of um, extra uh tracks and functionality which increase the transfer costs like uh, the censorship for the usdt needs to go through the uh the blacklist and, and etc so that's why they introduced uh, this token for minting and burnings so that it's, it's quite useful for like, for example, the market makers that you want to do lots of the frequent trading for this uh, token or, or pairs that you would, you would like keep doing the arbitrage, but you, because you just want to do the arbitrage, you don't need the token right away then it's good that you just have this minimum token. Um, then, then you don't need the actual token, then you can use it later. It's like a credit that you can use it for later. And then let's talk about the ticks and fees. So ticks is, um, it's, it's like the pricing between a token A and token B, for example, when at the beginning, when the tick is zero, and this is a formula. So as you can see, it's a 1.0001 to the power of i. So i, when tick is zero, then i is, uh, when, when tick is zero, so i is zero. Then the p price, the price will be one, which representing a one unit of token A, you can get a one unit of token B. And then there's uh, other examples that, when the tick is 10, that you calculate like this price, then the one unit of token A, you can exchange for 1.001 um, token B. And same thing with negative 10, then you can have like one exchange for 0.99. So why does a 1.001 essentially the, uh, the, the movement? So 0.01% is like the 0.01 is like the one basic point is like the, how much um, movement you could uh, uh, move the price. Essentially it's the fee 
that you could if you change this is it will shift bigger and then the the gap is the the fee that you can have one basis pawn two basis pawn uh, um etc okay so here's the uh q notation yeah i'll, I'll the topics I've selected is basically some of the important concept and the highlight on the V4. Um, that's why I'm jumping through different uh, concepts. But the most important is you just need to understand like what it is and how, how it works. I think that that's why I selected it. So Q notation is around a, a question that like a user has uh, like two if. And they want to create a liquidity position in uh, if USDC pool, and the current price of if is um, two thousand USDC, and they want to add liquidity in the range of um, the lower bound one thousand five hundred to the upper bound of uh, two thousand five hundred. Then, how much USDC do they need? In fact, is this huge? You uh formula that is using in the Uniswap V3 white paper, and it will continue to be using in V4. As you can see the formula, um, so that's the price for the output and X is the input. And you can see it's about the price, the square root of the price. Um, A is the lower bound and B is the upper bound, and then calculate the output. So. So the important concept is there's a square root. Um, yeah, and then you get the Y is a 5,000 through this uh, formula. But in Uniswap, um, in, in, sorry, in, in Solidity, square root is not really uh, friendly for Solidity, especially the, uh, the roundings. That's why they introduce uh, uh, Q notations and a Q number is called a Q64.96 uh, number. So Q64.96 number is a way to represent a rational number. And that's the formula there. So we, to represent one in a Q64.96 is one times two to the power of 96. And that would become like a long number. Um, for example, like um, like the one point triple zero two three four in solidity, it would just round it to one. Then you're missing the, the extra numbers. But in Q notation, it will be uh one point triple zero two three four times to the power ninety six. It become a big number. Then you round it up uh to just the uh, are uh, the big integer there, then you're only missing a small portion that you can still keep the large portion. Um, that would be helpful for the formula on the on the square root uh, price. And why it's important is because throughout the system, as you can see in the pool manager, there's a swap function. Um, it requires the the input is in the in the Q, Q number. And that's why you need to know the Q number and how to get it, then you can put it as a as an output. So in this uh, swap program, you can see um, tick, tick spacing is the tick we mentioned before. The key is the pool key. So each pool, you can get the tick spacing. Zero for one is a Boolean. True means is uh, swapping using token zero to token one, and false means uh, the other way around. Among specify is how much it is the input amount, and then the square square root price limit is the output amount. Essentially, that's the output plus the slippage. So that's why it's important to know um, about the Q number. Then you can calculate your output plus the slip page you want and turn it back to the Q 
queue number as a as an output param, um, so that you can use the swap function. Um, next important concept is the locking. So in this example, um, on the left hand side is the user. So the router contract is the one I mentioned before is the, the periphery. The periphery is the custom contract. Like you could create um, whatever contract you want as the router contract that using the periphery example, then you can interact with the, the pool manager, which is from the V4 core. And the hook contract is a, is a, is a optional. Like you could have the custom hook for the pool or you may not have it. But the most important is the locking that you need to have the router contract to call the swap. Then it will have an unlock callback to call back to trigger the callback back to your uh, router contract so that you can do the swap. You can call the swap function from, from the callback. And then the callback um, trigger the swap function, then it will trigger the, the, the hook that's uh, after swap, swap, before swap, then it's the actual swap. And then it will go, go, back, go back to the, um, uh, the callback. Uh, you could do the, uh, some of the balance delta, like the, that's the, the, the no ops. You could, you could basically customize the delta to do some extra stuff and then go back to the unlock. And this is useful that because now it's a single contract and, and the flash accounting that you're doing multi-hop. When you're doing multi-hop, that means um, you could have multiple swapping across different assets. That's why you need the locking to better manage the, the multi-hop multi scenarios. And you could have different types of hooks. The top bit is the, the basic one that you could initialize um, before and add liquidity and the before and add swap. Donation, I don't, yeah, donation is a, is a I don't see that really using that frequent. It's, it's more about uh, you could contribute to the, uh, the pool with the extra token uh, as a as a as a donation to the liquidity that you they can add the delta. So the no ops is the new thing that when I was in the incubation program that's being added. That was like in May, so which is like two months ago. <clears throat> so no no ops is essentially the changing the delta. Um, to to customize the delta. So by default, the delta is zero. When when you return delta, it will be zero. But when you enable the the no ops uh, hooks, that you could have a custom uh, delta that you want to do it. For example, this is a this is the AM, AMM hook that I implement as on the demo day. It's also open source. So in this example, you can see you define the, the hooks as a Boolean. Then you can say which hooks are enabled and disabled. And then you can see I was using one of the no ops as a after swap uh, return delta. Um, but yeah, that's how you uh, define it. And then in the no ops, uh, in this example, in my AM AMM hook, <clears throat> it essentially allowed changing the delta that you can see in my after swap, I enable the after swap uh, delta that <clears throat> in my example, um, there's a fee amount that I calculate from the based on the variable of uh, a swap amount. And then I can mean the ERC6909 uh, token. But then because I minted it, it will have the 
negative negative delta in the in the mean, then with my return, I need to tell it to minus the, the amount that I minus. And then in the pool manager uh, call, it will deal with the delta track so that it will become delta neutral, then it will pass the track um, uh, on, on the delta balance track. Okay, okay the next one is about the hook address uh, bitmap. <clears throat> so they introduce a, a, a hook deployment. Uh, this is related to the hook deployment, but I think don't need to take too much uh, into detail because they have a library to help you to uh, deploy it. Basically, it can help you to mine the, um, the hook address. Um, essentially, they will do the hook address <clears throat> representing the hook that you enabled. Uh, that's why they have a function to help you to mining the hook address and then deploy it there. So for example, this uh, hook address, it transferred to the binary like this because in nine, it from the bytes, it convert to binary as one zero zero nine. And this is the, the bitmap mapping. As a binary, you read from right to the left. So the index zero, if is this one, that is if this one is one, that means it enabled after we move liquidity returns delta. So same thing like this is like zero one two three four, so that means the index four is one. That means it enabled after donate. Same thing with this one is a seven. That means it enabled the before swap uh, hook. <clears throat> so that's basically how it works. And then convert back to the address is that nine. That it it means it enabled like the after uh, the before swap and the after donate uh, hook in there. And then we'll look up the, the, the hook, hook address to look up the hook contract and read the contract code from there. <clears throat> Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my submission on the on the hooker phone. Um, so that's the AM, AMM hook. The AM, AMM hook is built based on the paper um, called the AMAMM, uh, written by the uh, Uniswap team. So how it works is introducing an auction for uh, the, the swap fees, uh, option for the manager. So traditional limitation uh, on the fixed fee AMM is because of fixed fee, you could lose to the arbitrage, because of the fixed fee, and also is not a uh, fee optimized for um for the uh, the AMM, and then the AM AMM introduce uh, the auction uh, for the for the uh, manager uh, the winner as a manager to set a dynamic uh, swap fee, so which we can optimize the swap fee and has a higher return for uh, the LP. So this is how it works that it defines some um, different epochs. The epoch, you can define it like different time frame, for example, like one hour or one day. So say the current epoch is one, and then there's a future epochs. And the, a manager can come in to bid using the LP token to bid for epoch two. Um, so the the, there's a charging for a bit uh, as a as a fee that it can back to the uh, LP. Uh, so say the manager won winning as a winning manager, then the bit token, the LP token as a fee will be paid back to the LP. And then the manager too comes in can pay 10% more rent um, of the LP token and then become the new winner as a uh, epoch two. Then they can design um, the, the swap fee for that time frame um, as a dynamics fee there. And then similar thing that the manager um, 
But oh yes, then you can last for K epochs uh, as a winner. So you can set the uh the swap fee for this K epochs um as you are the manager. But then the manager free can comes in to bid uh as a winner with a 20% more rent, become a new winner from epoch three to epoch five. Then it will trigger a refund for the manager two for the epoch two. Um and then user comes in to do a swap. Another privilege for the manager is it collects the swap fees um, as a claim token. So when the user comes in to swap, then the, as a manager free is a winner on the epoch three to five, it can also collect the, the, all the swap fees. And the LP can enter and exit the pool anytime. So that's basically how it works in the high level for the AM, AMM. And this drawback for the this um, implementation is it could increase um, sandwich attack as the manager's ability to trade without fees. So there's a scenario that the manager can set a zero fee, then they can be they can be the only one to do the arbitrage because uh, other people um, because they was received the 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 fees and and uh, uh sorry they can yeah they can charge a, yeah how it works is it can charge a high sorry they can charge a higher fee that no ar other arbitrage can be profit from it only to accept the manager because the manager collect all the fees so that will increase the sandwich attack for the manager and also increase the centralization uh risk. And it also could cause of the volume driven that worst case because of the low volume, it could attract a no option, uh, no managers bidding for it. That means it will still be the same as the traditional constant function AMM. Um, yeah, so basically that's uh, uh, the talk. And the next step as I'm doing the research on the MDV, so I will keep finalize the data for the AM AMM hook and also planning to, to do more research on two uh, implementation. There's one is called the Nest Lobbins uh, directions. And this mean, uh, what they do is they increase the swap fee for close closer, bringing the price closer to the market market and and in you yeah, reduce the swap fee when it bring back the price close to the uh the market price and increase the swap fee when it de 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 deviate to the uh to the market price there's also another paper about uh sandwich resistant amm uh this is written by uh paradigm um how how they propose is about uh, delaying the the price uh, uh, reset on by the that by the slot to uh, resist the sandwich uh, attack, so that it will it, because the reset is a one block delay, so when they're doing a sandwich, it will be uh, in a loss when they sell it. Um, yeah, I'll bring it back to Peter. Uh, that that's pretty much. <clears throat> yeah, all right. I'll quickly do this, and then we'll loop back to questions. So the merch store is still open. Uh, next slide. And there are these two talks plus a talk on September the eighteenth. So David Highland Wood is going to talk to us about AI and Web three. And um, I'm, I've been doing a bit of forge scripting to actually simulate a blockchain, but you can use it for deploying contracts and doing all sorts of things. So uh, I'm going to do a bit of a talk about that. And then a pseudo anonymous um, speaker is going to give us a talk about a recent hack. Um, I think it's Wa Wazir, Wazir X. 
I, I think that's the that's what it was called. Um, so anyway, it's a um, a hack where quite a lot of money was um, taken, and so um, they are going to explain their analysis. Um, yeah, so that should be a really interesting talk. Um, and the next slide. And um, if you're here today um, on um, Meetup, you can watch this on um, YouTube later and you can see all the previous talks. There's a Slack workspace. If you're watching this on YouTube and you want to be able to ask the speakers tricky questions, then um, join the Meetup and come along. It's free. Um, and every now and again, there are there is Solidity um, code in, and I put the examples in that repo. So, are there any questions for Lecky? And I can see there is one question that happened about a quarter of an hour ago from David Highland Wood um, in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Peter. I, I was just kind of asking the group whether that um, solidity hack to make the calculation of the square root close enough wasn't very similar to some of the approaches we've seen in um, in older code, especially in gaming. You see stuff like that, and the one I remembered particularly was in Doom, where in order to be able to do three D modeling on some very basic hardware. Uh, I think one of the things that they did early was to um, uh, was to estimate the square root in a very similar manner. I was just curious if anybody knew that. Peter, you might know that. Uh, yeah, there was all sort. There's been all sorts of that sort of thing of doing everything in. I mean, in a certain number domain, which is essentially what Uniswap are doing, isn't it, Lucky? That that everything is in square root number domain um yeah yeah and it, the cons it's the consistency that's important versus the absolute number yeah 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 so i i didn't have so much of a question but as a a thought that i, I mean I, I saw the design that you've said about how all of the contracts are coming together and so that's good because there were fewer contracts and so you've got one pool, but how big is the total contract? Is it like on the verge of being too big for Ethereum? Yeah. Yes. Enable to deploy the V4 core, they, you have to have the specific configuration. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, when when you build it uh, locally, uh, the, yeah, you need to follow the the configuration. Um, they 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 have to build to deploy on your local, uh, chain. Um, to to play around with it. Um, yeah, it's it's on the edge, and that's also one of the reason why it takes so long. There are also one uh, uh, the 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 call. Uh, they're using it need to be upgraded. I forgot the name. I didn't put into the deck. Um, it's about temporary storage. A uh, new opcode. Um, yeah. So the V four is uh um pretty heavy because a single contract. Yes. Uh, I also asked the question like, you have one contract contains so much assets. Would it be risky? <laughs> and that, that's my silly question. And they, they said, oh, we are Uniswap team and we do lots of security all this. So it will be really top securities. I guess it, it will be, <laughs> I guess. Um, um, but yeah, if you are a really good, really, really good hacker, if you could hack the one contract, then you will be like, billions and trillions of dollars and of tokens yeah 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 it, it is yeah well i mean this is the thing so even uniswap v3 every the contracts were complicated enough but 
at least then, I mean, it's easier to comprehend and analyze when you've got less functionality. Um, yeah, I wonder if what it really means is that in, in Ethereum, generally, a better way of essentially separate classes. And, you know, like in Java, you've got classes and objects and things so that you can compartmentalize. Um, yeah, well, maybe that's what needs to happen somehow. I guess that's how they enable uh, hooks. Um... But yeah, we four is around guest optimization. Um, mm. Yeah, I think it's a really unique, innovative on we four. Um, mm. Yeah, we will see how it goes when they go live. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Are there any other questions? Okay. All right. Well, look. Lecky, thank you very much for your talk. Um, that was really very interesting. And I think now everyone has a more complete understanding of um, Uniswap the whole way out to V4, um, which is, I think, great. Um, so thank you for your time. And um, everyone, have a great day and see you all in two weeks' time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.